Welcome to the Lowdown on Ghana Web TV. This program covers all the relevant issues from the hard truth to the facts and fears. My name is Ni Akwe Ismail Akwe. Today we are going to discuss the media in Ghana and journalism. Journalism in Ghana has become more pluralistic than in the past and thanks to digital media and social media, now the traditional media is following social media and digital media to get the news. How did we get here and what has been the story in the past? Our guest today is a seasoned journalist and he's also a politician and he's going to take us through this journey and evolution of the media in the country. We'll be right back on the lowdown. Welcome back. This is The Lowdown. My name is Ni Akwe Ismail Akwe. And our guest is a former High Commissioner of Ghana to Namibia and Botswana. He is a former publisher of the Accra Daily Mail, the former editor of the Statesman newspaper, a prison graduate. I don't know if he calls himself <laughs> that. A former civil servant and a writer. He is Alaji Abdurrahman Haruna Atta. He adds MOV and he will tell us what the MOV means. Welcome, Alaji. Thank you very much, Ismail. Uh, you corrected that me this morning. I was saying Ismail. I think the uh, Muslims, that's how we pronounce it. Oh, it's Sumaila. <laughs> well, whatever. So the is. Arabic is Ismail. Uh -huh. And then the house has corrupted it, it to Sumaila. <laughs> yes. Right? So anyway, thank you. <laughs> well, nice having me on this program. And I'm very impressed that it's an all-female uh, crew. You yes. hardly find them in this town. So, mm. well, Ghana Web, mm. kudos. And as you see, more grace to your elbows. Thank you very much. Computers. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for coming. And you. your name has MOV. Yeah. What's the MOV? It's a national honor, one of the highest national honors. It's the member of the Order of the Volta. Okay. It's, uh, some people get the Grand Medal. And then the Order of the Volta, I, I think, has three components. Some are commander of the uh, Order of the Volta. Some are something or the other, it goes all the way to the top where heads of state get the star or the, of the star of Ghana or something. So that was given to me in um, in 20 something, 20 something, I can't even remember, for contribution to media development in Ghana. I see you are very proud of it because Absolutely. I've never seen anyone using it as part of their name. You are the only one who does yeah, it. But currently. they should. It's because of ignorance, I'm afraid to say. In the UK, when you are a say something, something, you use it. It's a sign of pride in having it and a sign of pride in your own country. So, member of the Order of the Volta. Volta shows my pride in my country. And I think all those the recipients, when you get it, just add it to your name. It doesn't take anything. And then when you are going to formal or some informal locations, you wear whether it's a pennant or the, uh, what do they call it, the sash, sash. or, or the, what you put in your pocket here. So, so it, it's just part of pride in belonging. So I would advise my co um, recipients and that's all over the world all over the country some are farmers some are engineers some are soldiers some are whatever so many so they should use it there's nothing to be shy about so that's why i use it all the time well that's that's <laughs> quite uh, inspiring and i'm <laughs> sure they would also follow your footsteps and i'm sure by yes. the time you get my to my age with this kind of work you are doing you also get an inshallah so we pray for it exactly. i'm proud about it yes. or the grand medal <laughs> yes. yeah. so you have so many titles uh, yeah. you used to be an editor you used yes. to be a civil servant you used to be an ambassador which was most recent yeah, yeah. which one do you cherish the most funny the ambassadorial job mm. it's it's a very very trying job because when you take that appointment uh, it's not to go and be drinking champagne or just uh, going to parties. Yes, there are diplomatic receptions, but it actually means work, working for the uh, advancement of your country. It brings in all the um, uh, things you've learned through your life. I went in not as a trained diplomat, but what they call the political appointees. For the first few months, I had to use to learn, and I learned on the job. And by the time I was leaving, I think I had done so much work for Ghana. I'm proud to say that the something we call the PJCC, the uh, 
the Joint Commission, Permanent Joint Commission of Cooperation between Ghana and Namibia, for example, had been in abeyance for about 12 years. When I went within the first year, I was able to uh, get it going. And the PJCC is the platform on which uh, nations discuss matters of interest, set up uh, the policies they want to uh, follow, the areas of cooperation. So it's a lot, lot of work. And then you have to do with the uh, personal relationships with your hosts and um, also with your staff, with your Ghanaian staff. So it's a lot of work. I found it more exciting out of all my um, my experiences. And maybe the next I can say uh, of my life is my student, my time as a student, mm. secondary student. Those <laughs> were great days. I don't think anybody <laughs> who's attended secondary school will not mark his or her secondary school days as one of the most exciting in their lives. Which school did you attend? Navasco, the great Navasco. <laughs> oh, I should have won my Navasco uh, anniversary. Yeah, that were in KNUSD. Yeah, this year. <laughs> Our anniversary is this year. So, <laughs> did you start writing in Navasco? Mm, yes and no. Not formally, but a little article here, a little article there. In uh, We had some small magazine and it got us into trouble even once. And I was suspended from school for one year. I, I, I never had my <laughs> lower sex education. Mm -hmm. And some were uh, expelled because uh, the authorities thought the magazine uh, was rather a little too risque. Mm -hmm. And in those days, there were certain things they just couldn't tolerate, especially if it had sexual content. Mm. So the authorities came on us very, very hard. I had a year suspension. Wow. And, um, so writing has put you in trouble so many times. So many times. And I introduced you as a prison graduate, <laughs> and it has to do with writing as well. With writing. Yes, so that's one yeah. of the riskiest role you've ever played. Yes, yes, yes. But prison too, it's a subculture. When you go in, depending <clears throat> on the crime that sent you there, the prisoners can rally around you and give you such moral support. I got it when I was uh, first at uh, Nsawam, and later I was transferred to Akusi uh, local prison. I remember once I fell really ill with malaria, and all the prisoners in my cell rallied, boiled hot water, helped me massage myself. I don't know where they got the money from, but they bought a uh, rob. Yeah. and came and robbed my, uh, <laughs> grabbed rather my body. Mm -hmm. So I saw compassion in prison, something you don't associate prisoners with. But then I also saw deprivation. Mm -hmm. Our society doesn't treat prisoners well at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you go in a Ghanaian prison and you are like an <coughs> animal, you are forgotten, unless you have people who come in and visit you and see you. The food is horrible, there's something they call Zontoli and manpower, yeah. uh, <laughs> terrible. So that experience is also there for me. Yeah. You've spoken widely about the prison experience. Yeah. Today we are going to talk about the journalism experience. Fantastic. And uh, what took you to prison was contempt of court charge. Yes. Yes. And uh, I, I want to know if you had written or you had done that article today, do you think you would have gone to prison? No, we've, we've come so far. Contempt these days should would not send you to jail really and in, in in those days even the contempt that sent me to jail was because the uh lady that sent me to court was my sister-in-law mrs rawlings uh the lower court um had freed us i went in with uh, mr baku Kweku baku and the lower court had well the judge had done a very um, balanced <laughs> ruler. She cited that for contempt, and we wanted her um, what the injunction also vacated. So the judge refused to uh, vacate the injunction, and then he also refused to uh, send, send us in. Then she went and uh, petitioned the Court of Appeal. So the case actually was decided by the Court of Appeal, not the High Court that was supposed to handle it. So the three judges on the panel, one of them disagreed with his two uh, elderly um, uh, colleagues, 
and so they sent us in. Uh, they have since died, sadly, mm. but well, that's the way of life. <laughs> <laughs> they are better, they are gone. So, currently, we don't have a lot of journalists facing any of these things you are talking about. Mm. The system has changed. Yeah. Writing has changed. Yeah. Uh, the media is pluralized. And we have a lot of media houses from the print to broadcast to uh, the digital media and all of them, so many of them. Collectively, there will be more than 100. And uh, you are also or still writing to feed into these media uh, houses that we have. How do you see the media right now as compared to the media in the past? Is it a positive growth or is boring, as some people say, because others say, well, we miss the media of the past. In the past, it was so rough and it was uh, so, so, so hard and difficult to, to cut through. And we don't have so many people in there, a few people who are very factual and very ethical than now. How do you see it? It's very interesting. What I was coming, I, I, I pulled out something online. When you gave me the invitation, I decided to do a little research. You don't appear on programs like yours, uh, <laughs> not prepared. So I, I want to just read you something. I have a reason for doing it. It's just a small paragraph. Mm -hmm. It says, the Gold Coast Gazette and Commercial Intelligencer was published from 1822 to 25 by Sir Charles McCarthy, governor of the Gold Coast uh, Settlements. Uh, as a semi-official organ of the colonial government, the central goal of this Cape Coast newspaper was to, <laughs> to provide information to European merchants and civil servants in the colony. Recognizing the growing number of mission-educated Africans in the Gold Coast, the paper also aimed at promoting literacy, encouraging rural development, and listen to this, and quelling the political aspirations of this class of native elites by securing their loyalty and conformity with the colonial system. So you would ask, <laughs> so what has changed from 1822-25? That was a clear agenda. That was a clear agenda. Mm. That was a clear agenda. So newspapers and the media are normally established with agenda. I do not believe that you just set up a newspaper for the bloody mindedness of it. You want to push a certain line, political, economic, religious, and so on. So we've come a very, very, very long way to the days when the Daily Graphic uh, then grew out of, uh, what is it, the Sandy Mirror, then the Ghanaian Times, then GBC grew out of uh, Station Zoy, came to the Ghana Film Industries Corporation. I'm sure you've forgotten about it, mm -hmm. but it was the leading uh, post-independence sort of media producing house. It's now become TV3. Mm -hmm. It was set up by the British in 1948 as the Gold Coast Film Unit. And our greatest president, of course, Kwame Nkrumah, thought far and mm. in, invested in it and developed it into a full-fledged film industry. In those days, we didn't have the electronic media. So the film industry produced newsprints, documentaries, and other social animation material for the country. So if you remember films like Mr. Mensa Builds a House, The Boy Komasenu, etc., they were the feature side of things. So the Ghana Film Industry Corporation was such a major, major partner of GBC. GBC, that, that grew out of this station, Zoe, I was telling you about. So GBC and Ghana Films, between them, were producing all the material that we needed. And in those days, too, we had the Information Services Department, let's not forget. So they were like the implementing agency of all these things. So they had a fleet of vans, they went around the country, and um, those were great days for us when we were children. When the film van is coming to a village or a town, oh, it was a source of uh, uh, joy. Then we would rush and then they would show films, mainly government policies and so on and so forth. And then it grew, it grew and grew and grew and then came to, like I'm saying, graphic and times. They then took the mantle. The Ghanaian Times, that one yeah. came from the Guinea press, eh? the Guinea press. Kwame Nkrumah again took it up for the party 
and then after the uh, 66 coup, the NLC transformed it into a state-owned uh, media for the country. The National Graphic, you know. So, so within that time, many things grew up. It was in 1957 that we had the uh, Ghana News Agency, the, the GNA, and then also we had the development of the film education institutions mm -hmm. like the GIJ, yeah. uh, uh, and so on. And now they've all grown up, and there are many. My good friend, uh, Professor Kojo Yanka, his uh, school of uh, school, great yes. school, great, great school. So all these things are there. So we've come a long way. That's why I'm giving just a short history. And so it, within the period two, I became a board member first of uh, Ghana News Agency. That was the, during, yeah, Ghana News Agency. And then later, I also became a board member of the Ghanaian Times. Mm -hmm. So I seem to have done quite a lot of uh, media work in my life. All very exciting. And then we've come to this, these days. These days, you have the advantage of technology. Mm. You have the advantage of technology. And those of you who are professional, like your good self and Ghana Web, I was telling you earlier on, we all used to depend on Ghana Web years ago when it started. Yeah. That was when everybody was sending messages to Akoto, Akoto, and so on. But now I see you've grown, you are adding so many things to your stables. So it's now different. So I can say that. Um, out of this uh, history and this mix of media, the country has benefited. Yeah. I think it would be wrong and churlish to say that the uh, country hasn't benefited from our media. Through uh, people like you, the, the, the younger media people, we are getting a lot of information. And I disagree. I think you are as racy, if not racier, than we were. Mm. Yeah, because the technology allows you to dig, dig deeper and move wider afield than we were doing. We were ha handicapped. Because I can tell you something. When we started uh, the, uh, our media after the 1992 constitution, which opened things up, and everybody was established and establishing a newspaper and uh, newspaper, radio stations and whatever. We didn't even have the proper working tools. The, to do a newspaper, we still did the cut and paste. We will cut, paste here, paste here, and mm -hmm. so on. But now everything technology, unless you don't have the money to do it, mm -hmm. but the means to do it is there. Yeah. So it's given us a lot of, lot of, um, variety in the media and that's why a plural media is there we shouldn't fight a plural media i disagree with the people who say you should conform with each other no you be as different as possible be as different and as innovative as possible the country would only benefit <coughs> excuse me from that our period let me tell you this little history my good friend cabral Blair, ambassador cabral Blair, yeah. me here. He was the one, I think, who went online first with the independent. So it was a cause for him to, uh, to bluff with his pioneering role uh, <laughs> in getting online. So the first newspaper to go online. To go online. Yes. So he, and that time it was Africa Online. Yeah. All of us later became Africa Online, Africa mm. Online. That was even the uh, email address of my newspaper until we moved on. And I also, in my own little way, it may or not mean anything, either the first or part of the first to introduce the use of digital cameras to do my pictures and do my pages. Mm. So it was then a very small camera like this and I was carrying it all over the place. I cherished it so much, I wasn't even giving it to my reporters. <laughs> <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to do my own pictures. So I remember the uh, late Jacob H. Belante once told me that he says to me, Abdul, Abdul Rabat, you are too old to be doing this. <laughs> let, 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 let your reporters do it. But then that's how um, the status uh, was in those days. Technology was almost nil mm. and then of course it started building up 
then okay. other uh, uh, surveys, media, whatever, started building and then just opened up. Okay, thank you very much for the history. <laughs> and I was quiet because <laughs> I wanted you to take us deeper and give us more. So we'll go on a break. Okay. And when we come back, we look at uh, segmenting the media in terms of looking at the past and now. Yeah. We look at the agenda, yeah. how the agenda setting was done. Also, we look at uh, the quality of content. Okay. And then we also look at social media and yeah. also digital media in total. This is a lowdown. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to The Lowdown. My name is Ni Akwe Ismail Akwe. We are discussing the state of journalism in Ghana and how far we've come with Alhaji Abdurrahman Haruna Atta. So you were t telling us about some history from post-independence, I mean pre-independence era to post-independence. Now we want to look at the agenda setting role of the media. How was it before? And how is it now? I know in your period, the media wanted to have some sort of democracy. And you had publications by your newspaper, The Statesman, by uh, Kwekubaku's newspaper, I think uh, the, 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 guide. the Guide, and so many other newspapers that were setting an agenda for, to have freedom of the, the press, freedom of speech, and democracy in total. How was it like before? Before it was fairly stiff, it was dominated by the state-owned media. When you are talking of the print media, graphic and times, and of course uh, the electronic media were mainly um, GBC and Ghana films, like I told you, and of course Ghana News Agency. Yeah, so it was all government controlled. It was muzzled, completely muzzled by the, yes. uh, by the government. So as private media, how did you survive? It was very difficult. It was a, it was a, a hand to mouth existence. Mm -hmm. Advertising wasn't coming because uh, business people and other people were uh, afraid to advertise in our newspapers to get penalized. So any day you got just a one page advert from somewhere, ah, it was a source for uh, uh, jubilation because then you know a little knock of fuel will come from that for you to eat. But uh, it was very difficult, and then the media atmosphere was unfriendly. You remember once uh, uh, Mr. Baku's newspaper, they even went and she dropped she, she <laughs> bombed it and so on. So it was very, very uh, uh, difficult and unfriendly. But then we fought on, we fought on, and um, later credit must be given to President Kufour. He was very open to us when he was in opposition. And so we would meet him every now and then, and we kept hammering that what he should do, his living legacy, would be to abolish the criminal libel section mm. of the criminal code. So it was from us, we put pressure on him, and um, truly to when he uh, won the elections and became president, that was one of his first legislative actions, to um, abolish the criminal uh, libel section of the criminal code. Could we say the media played a role? I, I mean, the, the, the oppo then it wasn't opposition media. Yeah, 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 uh, yes. did, they, did you play a role in Kufour's election? We, we did, we did. We did very much so. At that time, the interesting thing was that um, President Rawlings had stayed for a, for a length of time that I think people were tired of him, really. And um, they wanted a change. We also wanted a change. In fact, I developed a very uh, robust attitude towards him because I thought um, he had not only overstayed, but then he had dictatorial and authoritarian tendencies. And that was the basis of my media fight with him. Nothing else, after all. Why should I fight him? He's, um, he was my... Uh, wife's sister's husband so really we should be on good terms mm. maybe even if i had behaved myself i'd probably 
would have had some droppings from the government. <laughs> but anyway, that's a joke. Yeah. So I, I, uh, I was very robust uh, in my columns in those days. It was called taking issue. And I took issue with him because I thought his style of governance was not exactly what the constitution was about because we all struggled to get this constitution through, but he still retained vestiges of say, when he says something, it shouldn't be uh, opposed. So I did it, Kweku Baku, uh, my good friend, uh, Ibn Kwaku of the Free Press, mm. and so many other names uh, were involved in this ambition to get the media landscape at least cauterized of um, the kind of tendencies that was keeping us down. So in those early days, after the 1992 constitution, we were like little kids in a candy store. We were all over the place, and stealing from here, putting this in our mouth. So we were a little unruly. Mm. That's what we were, we were a, a little unruly. We didn't cross-check our stories. We didn't ask for uh, second opinion or give the other person the chance because we had an agenda back mm. to the word your word because the agenda was to get rid of rawlings uh -huh. so we worked hard and luckily we had a listening year uh, from uh, the candidate before then and then when he became president uh, to he was very open to, to us and so that uh, quietude started coming. The media scene started becoming quite um, very open and very relaxed on us, though we were unruly and robust mm. up to this day. Why I'm saying that you people are no worse than us is that you are doing precisely the same thing we were doing. I don't think you should um, underrate your efforts. The problem is that, you mentioned it, the development of the citizen uh, journalism thing has meant that anybody now can call themselves a journalist, really. Uh, in the US, for example, when they ask you your, your, your job, your journalist, they don't ask you where you went and trained. For them, once you are a journalist and you are given voice to the freedom of expression, that's your job. Nobody's really interested in whether you have a certificate or not. An employer may because they will be looking for uh, qualified people. Mm. So for them, trained journalists would be what they will go out for. But there are some people who don't care. Once you can write and once you can dig things out and go out there, fine. So in, in the US right now, we have um, Fox. Yes. CNN. People say Fox is right-wing supporters of Trump, and then CNN, left-wing. The New York Times is considered uh, <laughs> the main left-wing uh, newspaper in the U.S., and so on and so forth. So we, we have those divisions. The divisions become uh, vile and unpalatable when we now start pushing violent or uncompromising political or politicians' viewpoints. So then it, the problems start coming. Mm -hmm. But the plurality or pluralism itself does not pose problems. So those days as editor of The Statesman, what was a typical morning like? Was it uh, calling people to ask what has Rollins done wrong so we publish? How do you get your stories? We got our stories, or some got their stories mainly from newspaper vendors, sadly mm. to say. There was no serious editorializing going on. The newspaper vendors would determine that your headlines would sell or not. And they would let you know. Me, they used to tell me when I uh, formed the Accra Mail, and I decided to move away from this kind of journalism. And that's why I named the paper the Accra Mail. I wanted the city to have its own newspaper mm. uh -huh, that can report on many different things around the city and pe bring people's awareness to the problems of the city, the aspirations of the city. And I 
almost went under within the first month because the vendors had uh, ganged up against it. They said it wasn't hot enough. So I saw one of my leading vendors and I asked him, I said, oh, hey, pepper no and yes, she. And I said, oh, but oh, pepper, they don't have to be she. And then uncle for pepper. So they won't sell it. When they, <laughs> they take the newspapers in the morning, those that cons they consider and yes, she, they put them in their armpits like this, <laughs> and then they hold the headlines of the, uh, the, she, the, the ones. she ones. <laughs> yeah. So that was the determinant factor for uh, casting headlines, front pages, what the vendors would say. So for me as an editor, first at the Statesman, the work was very easy for me because it was political. Mm. So you could just pick any political something and just uh, splash on the, uh, on the front page. But like I'm saying, when I started doing my own newspaper, which I invested in myself, and I wanted to change the paradigm, I was a lot more careful because now you are dealing with things that needed facts mm -hmm. and not just the sentiments and emotions of your political leaning. So that was a typical day for me, really. Then, like I said, we didn't have proper production met methods. So now the, you put things together. Now the cut and pasting will start and so on. And then you finish. And then you are carrying the, uh, what we call them, there was a name we had for them. The, there's a name, anyway, I forget them. Then you carry them physically to the press or the press people will come to your house, the, their house, and pick those cut and paste things with the separate photographs. Mm. So they will go and make uh, films of the photographs, and then they have the uh, text. They had a way of matching these things, and then they will print. And if you are lucky, they get it right, and it comes out the next day. So quality was a problem then? It was a problem. Quality was a problem. Oh, there was a time when you would even print because you couldn't afford the good printers. So you'd go to some wayside printer who couldn't give you quality because that's what you could afford. And there are times when they print pages, certain pages, you couldn't even <laughs> read what was printed. The quality was just uh, zero. It means that besides the agenda setting, yeah. there was also the commercial part, which could have attracted some people to go into the media to invest in, uh, uh, I mean, independent media because they wanted to make money. Yeah, yeah. But, but the, 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 the Guardian businessmen or the people who had money were not so sure about such investments. Yeah, because the, the, the governments they find as um, prickly. So who wants to put his, his money into a venture that could easily have problems overnight? So that's, that's the, that was a real problem. It was a cottage industry. I don't think we were serious newspapers as such. It was a cottage industry where you go and set a few of you, editor. In those days too, we didn't have these mobile phones as common as they are today for you to even be <laughs> looking yeah. for stories and so on and so forth. So you were just there in that little office you shared with others. You did your cut and paste, and also another technical, uh, technological thing. So when we finish all of that, we then copy whatever it is on CDs, and then send the CD to the uh, Africa online or whoever was putting it online, and we give it to them physically, and then they will sit at their place there and then do it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> put it now it's different. You can do all so of that. So that was your attempt to go online. Online. So you yes. put it on CDs, CDs. and give to the to online the managers, managers to put it up. Put it up. Yeah. <laughs> that was quite interesting. It was quite hectic. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so so you've come really far, and now the digital space uh, is wide, is bigger. Social media is is there for everybody to be a citizen journalist, as you explained, and citizens are now sending their articles to be published online on the biggest media houses like ours, Ghana Web. How do you see that from then when it comes to citizen participation in the news making? Do you receive letters to publish in your newspaper or do you go out there to talk to people to have them or their views published? 
Oh, we would receive letters. Our post boxes used to be full of letters and unsolicited for articles. So you didn't even have to go out to seek the, the, the content. The, the box office, uh, PO box, would uh, <laughs> deliver uh, sacks of letters from readers and um, people who just wanted to publish something. And um, so we had space for everyone in those days who would contact us. Some people may even just call us and tell us that, oh, they've seen a story in our paper, we should hold a page, uh, they'll do a rejoinder. So in those days, we took the um, constitutional uh, requirement of rejoinders very seriously, at least I did. When I did something and um, someone brought a rejoinder, we published it the next day, usually where we printed it, we didn't hide it inside. If it was on the front page, we'll put it on the front page. Mm. So that's how we did it. No, it was never a dull moment, really. Never a dull moment. But you were always on tenterhooks. Mm. Uh, you were always on tenterhooks. But now things have really changed. The only problem I have right now is that there's no editing going on because of the uh, uh, citizen journalism there. And I think maybe the uh, online editions are overwhelmed, so they don't always read what comes to them. So you go online and you start reading certain errors that you think an editor should correct. I'll give you two examples from me, me just last week. To rein in, R-E-I-N, they mm -hmm. should rein in whatever. I wrote to rein in, R-E-I-G-N, like the rain, the rain yes. of a king as different from reigning in. Mm. And my editors here and elsewhere didn't correct me. The same mistake was, the, everywhere. was, was everywhere. I was so embarrassed. Harunata can't tell the difference between rain and rain. But I had given it. <laughs> I thought my editors uh, would uh, uh, read through. But then you do well. There's a young man. Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not campaigning for him. Kent Mensah. He does the uh, Mail Online or something. Yeah. Occasionally he would read and then called me and said, oh, editor, is this what you mean? <laughs> and I said, oh, Kent, God bless you. God bless you, my son. If this had gone out without you reading it, I would have been uh, embarrassed. So that's the only thing I think you should do better, the editing. And then the second thing was that there was a place I should have just used an A to make the sentence meaningful and for some reason i missed it and it's not as if i just write and send it to you people i have someone i call my um uh, peer reviewer i'll send it to him every article i do i'll send it to my peer reviewer before i uh, post it to you mm. and um he also misses all these things. So it's a difficult thing. And that's why, again, in those good olden days, the office or the job of a proofreader was a very important one in a newsroom. Mm. Very, very important for a newsreader. Because you can miss little, little things that then would render your story, a sentence, meaningless. And then there are sometimes, too, after writing... I, I said to myself, oh, isn't this sentence a little long-winded? Could the editor have cut it a little for me? So we do that, but it's not your fault, really. Yeah. Yeah, it's not your fault. Yeah, so that's what uh, is exciting about the media. Mm. So soon we'll talk about citizen journalism and your position on that, and yeah. also we'll talk about training institutions, journalism training institutions. Are you a journalist when you attend or you have the skill of journalism? or you can be a journalist if you are quiet on the job or any other way. We'll come back on that after this break. Welcome back to The Lowdown. My name is Ni Akwe Ismail Akwe. Our guest is Alaji Haruna Atta, Mr. Abdurrahman. I have to add that. Please do. <laughs> so we are talking about the media then and now. And citizen journalism. Facebook is a big proponent of citizen journalism. 
we have Twitter, we even have uh, YouTube where bloggers go around and take videos and do interviews and post them all over. And they are all calling themselves journalists. Is it a position you would ascribe to or you think is, is an overshot of the, of the role of journalism? Now, journalism, you see, unlike other professions, I think it's the only profession which takes its uh, source from the UN Convention on Human Rights, the, the freedom of expression, which has been domesticated in almost every constitution on this planet, the freedom of expression. So media work, journalism, therefore takes its source from there. It does not prescribe that you must have a degree or a certificate to practice. What it allows is that you have something to say. That's the basis of journalism. So uh, earlier in the practice of journalism, Joseph Pulitzer, the founder of uh, the Columbia University School of Journalism, he was the one who said, no, journalists cannot just be allowed to just flit about. Journalists must be trained and journalists must uh, have the, in quotes, the kind of respectability of doctors, lawyers, uh, and the other professions, accountants, and so on. So it was from that time, around, twin, at around 1911, when he wrote that his famous uh, treatise on journalism, that people really started now thinking that, oh, then journalism can be a discipline that should be studied. And I agree, it should be studied. My uh, relationship with journalism comes from my degree from UST because I studied graphic design and many aspects of graphic design is just uh, media work, how to cast um, uh, 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 this thing we use for uh, ad advertising. There's a word you, you use for it. I'm growing old, my <laughs> mind is getting mixed up. But then how to cast a line, all these things, I learned them in the university. Yeah. And then UST at that time, at the College of Art, English was compulsory. If you failed English in your FUE, you would be sacked. So I did English for three years and only dropped it in my uh, last year. Uh, in that, in those days, the Faculty of Arts did four years. So we, you drop it. And so my training was from that angle. And it shows in the way one does things, one writes. So I believe that some training is necessary. Uh, even though you are <laughs> filling in the voice of the voiceless as a result of the freedom of expression, but some training is, is good. But then I haven't said that without training, it does not mean you can't practice as a journalist. In the good old days, again, back to the good old days, you learned your craft on the job. Mm -hmm. Many of our pioneers, especially at Graphic and Times, but especially at Graphic, they learned their craft on the job and did so well. Later, they were sent to the UK to places like the Thompson Foundation. I don't know if it's still in existence. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes which gave our senior journalists in those days, again, more or less on the job uh, training. So training for me is very important. Uh, at least it, you learn the use of the language. Language is very, very important. Today we are uh, arguing or debating whether do, uh, do or die is the same as all die be die. I think it's the subject of my article today. I don't know whether you've seen it. Yeah, so it's all to do with language. Journalism cannot uh, function if you don't have the good language, either written or spoken. If you are not trained and you are a citizen journalist, really that's what you are. You can't consider yourself a professional journalist. And I think there should be a place for professional journalists, whether they learnt it on the job or they learnt it in the classroom. Our top, top men, people like uh, Ken Bediaku, who used to be the top sports journalist in this country. Uncle Ken is now an old man. But people like him, people like uh, um, one of the great editors, um, he wrote a book, The Gab Books, 
Cameroon Dodo, these were great editors, you see. So we, I think, rather, that yes, there should be training and we should have room for the citizen journalists, but we should not let them overwhelm the professionalism of journalism. Journalism is not a place you should go to because you have nothing else to do or nowhere else to go to. Go to journalism with the intention that you want to be a journalist. You want to write. You want to be in the print or uh, electronic media. And then you come out as a very good uh, journalist. I believe in that. Now, if we talk about uh, getting training and some skill, there's a school of thought that the journalism institutions, which are also growing, there's a proliferation of them, but they are bringing out or churning out a lot of journalists who are half-baked. They're only learning the theory, and when they come into institutions or media institutions, they are unable to, to, to produce quality content as professional journalists are supposed to. Have you encountered any of that? I have, and, and it's heartbreaking. And so you are right, absolutely right. That's why I mentioned the uh, GIJ, I mentioned the uh, uh, Kojoyan case place, and then of course the mother of all of them at the School of Communication uh, Studies in uh, Ligon. Yeah, there are many mushroom uh, schools of journalism, and I think they are more also the problem than the uh, how big journalists they churn out. Yeah, because um, the half big journalists they churn out have the degrees or the certificates or whatever it is they give them, but you encounter them in a newsroom, and uh, it is a nightmare. Uh, a half big journalist in a professional newsroom is a nightmare to some editors and editors. Yeah, so I still believe that we should look for the good institutions of journalism or any of the communication uh, arts and sciences. Like I told you, my background was in graphic design, but it had elements of communication. So I came out with a degree that I could use to communicate, which is very important. And that's what journalism is all about. Citizen journalism has not always been mm, something for me to encourage because then they, um, they take up all sorts of issues that sometimes end up, end up adding tension to society. You see, and that's what I believe uh, professional journalists try to avoid. Professional journalists would use all the tricks of the trade to get whatever uh, it is out without going out to, um, to be bloody minded, if I can use that word. So let's encourage uh, those people interested, young people interested in doing journalism or becoming journalists to apply for and get places at GIG, um, the African uh, University of Communication. African uh, University College, College of Communications. Of communications yes. Yes. And, um, and such places. I don't think we should encourage mediocrity in any profession. But unfortunately, the traditional media, which is more professional, is now following the citizen journalists on social media to get their sources and get their information. And we are seeing that in some stories that, uh, you know, pulled down because the, the source wasn't real. Someone who posts a picture of somebody holding a human head, excuse me to say, and say someone was killed somewhere. Then quickly you see it on the traditional media, which is more professional. And later they say, oh, it's a picture of two years ago. So we're sorry for, we are sorry for the publication. It is laziness. Mm -hmm. Another problem of Ghana these days is intellectual laziness. So whatever they did, me, I, I, I saw it to a extent, but I deleted it. You see, I get all of these things too, but the moment I see things dealing with children, hmm, whether it's something good about a child, I delete it. Animals, whether it's something good or bad about an animal, I delete it. Uh, certain things that show disrespect to women, I delete it. I'm talking of uh, this, um, what's it called? The, uh, what we have on the phone. The WhatsApp, the WhatsApp messages, thing. Yes. So it goes all around. Let's have the, that mindset. The uh, editors must know what to delete on site and not do it. So for what they put out in this paper, I think it's, uh, it's laziness. If their editors are very smart, there are many, many areas 
that are not getting uh, getting touched on. There could be niche newspapers for such things, and we will read. It, it doesn't mean when you put uh, something that is not she on your front page, uh, people won't read. There is a class of people who would read. So even if they have to become niche newspapers for such quality, why not? After all, they are lucky, especially Graphic and Times. They are still being supported by the government in many respects. The, the, the Graphic uh, earns its uh, money from its own commercial activities and yeah. to some extent uh, Ghanaian Times. Too. But they are still state-owned newspapers. And they carry that uh, title that gives them leverage over all the other papers. Mm. So you see the number of adverts in uh, Graphic you wonder why everybody is rushing to graphic. It's because of that state-owned title they have. But one thing that's quality are your articles. And I'm looking at some of them. The titles themselves are quite uh, appealing. So I see one, coup d'etat. And how you even spelled it? Coup d'etat, C-O-O-D-E-T-A. The sports child of Ethiopia. <laughs> and then <laughs> cathedral, cathedral of Doom, Concerns of Muslims Brushed Aside. Bad Blood, The Cross, Star and Crescent Spa in Ghana, and so on and so forth. And I can see the book you wrote on uh, John Mahama, Awini Pa Nkasa. You have very interesting titles. How do you come by them? It's Is by, it experience? It's, by, it's, 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 uh, it's all combined, but like I told you, it's language. Mm. Make use of language. Study language. Be sensitive to language. To be a good writer or a good journalist, study language. My daughter is even a better writer. You may have heard of her, Aisha Harunata. Yes. She's written four novels. The first one she tried even had the um, shortlist for a Commonwealth uh, Writers' Prize. So it's to do with language. And I'm sure she picked a lot of language from me and her mother, who was a very good uh, editor. Unfortunately, she's not well. She has multiple cirrhosis and she's in a wheelchair right now. But her mother was one of the best editors I had ever met. She worked with me on The Statesman and then worked with me briefly on the Accra Mail before the sickness made, uh, made her activity in, impossible in life. Yep. So, so language is important, Ismail. Uh, you can't under mind language in writing journalism so <laughs> talking about your daughter you know when anyone googles haruna Atta, she comes she up. comes from, yeah, 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 I'm, now, I'm, <laughs> no now, I'm now uh, how do i say uh, uh, my claim to fame is uh, my it's daughter is not mine yes <laughs> <laughs> but as a parent you are proud when such a thing happens well, yeah, anyway it's yeah. great to have you here and yeah. uh, if you have any last or final statements you want to make before we go yeah but it's not the final statement as such i'm just going to thank you and say continue the good job because there was a time when you started or uh, ghana web started there was nothing else that time even your your email or whatever was a koto at a koto or something now i realize you've changed everything so you've moved you've moved you become big and then continue the good job like i told you earlier on I like the way you do. I sent you articles. You don't just publish it. You look for newsy parts of it and turn them into stories. That's the professionalism I'm talking about. So let us do that and let's leave a little space for the citizen journalists. They can never uh, outclass or outrun professional journalism. The rest assured. They will make noise, 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 noise. But professional journalists will still survive. Thank you very much for coming. Alaji Abdurrahman Haruna Atta. This was quite an informative interview and uh, we'll have this every Monday on Ghana Web TV. My name is Ni Akwe Ismail Akwe. Be safe.